since 2019. Previously, he was in the role as the Deputy Principal of LSD from 2016. And before his journey began at LSD School, Nick spent 10 years at Koei Manor School, where he was a teacher, a team leader, and a Deputy Principal in his last two years. Prior to all that, Nick spent six years away from New Zealand teaching in London, Sydney, and Singapore before returning home to Auckland. For nearly all of his teaching career, Nick has worked in full primary school support and teaching students from ages 5 to 13 years. Today, Nick's here to introduce us to Ellerslie Cares, a program from Ellerslie um, School. Ellerslie Cares is a school-based initiative started to help address some of the challenges the school community has faced since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. The main purpose of LSV Cares is to develop a stronger connection and engagement with the school community to ensure all families and whanau receive the support they need to enable their children to have the best chance of succeeding at school. The main areas of support the school is focused on is providing financial, professional and community services, welfare and engagement. So please welcome Nick Butler, Principal of LSV Primary. Good morning everyone. I hope you're looking very sprightly. I'm sure some of you may have watched the rugby last night, that went to midnight. Uh, it was worth watching right to the end. There will be some controversy I'm sure for the next two or three days over that one. Um, look, thank you so much for inviting me. Karen, you are fantastic. Um, your efficiencies we love at LSD. You are brilliant on email and communicating with us and I think um, from our point of view, it's, it's just uh, reminded us of our really important connection we have in our community with organisations like Rotary. Um, we were a little bit in the wilderness, I think, for a little while there in, in, uh, a few years ago. Uh, and then I think I turned up here maybe three, or three years ago um, and reconnected with Rotary. Um, and you very generously gave us um, some money to go towards our Principal's Discretionary Hardship Fund, which was fantastic and really made a, a, big, a big difference to a number of our students. Today I'll just give you a, a little quick brief reminder of who we are and, um, and what's happening in our world. A little bit of things around um, um, the state of COVID, what, what's COVID sort of highlighted for us and the reason why we've got some initiatives going to try and um, you know just improve the outcomes for all our uh, our students, but also we're a little bit of, of, around improving the outcomes for our families as well, because of course it's all related and all, all goes together. Um, we can't solve everyone's problems as schools, and sometimes our brief is, is we have to stick to our brief a little bit. You know, we can only go go so far. But what COVID really showed us is um, Fano and, and community families looked all of a sudden started looking to school for, for direction. And because we'd send out lots of communications that came from the ministries and the government, and we became a real central focus for what was going on. And so all of a sudden, our briefs slightly changed. And I didn't think we'd be running around our community delivering food, food parcels or Chromebooks or check in with people, but we actually effectively became that organisation as well. Um, so things have, the, the, the paradigm has shifted and it won't go back to the way it was. Um, if anything, it's probably highlighted some of the things that were already simmering as concerns uh, and now we're probably in a better spot, position to address some of those concerns. And don't get me wrong, things aren't all bad. <laughs> there are many things that are going really well in our communities. Um, but I do, when I moved to Ellerslie School, I really got a sense of Ellerslie as a great community. And within you know uh, a few minutes of moving to Alizzi, I was in the Santa Parade dressed up as a, a toucan, wandering around the, like this, and in a very hot day. And I just realised um, that the Alizzi community is pretty pretty special. Um, and Alizzi School uh, has been in that community a long time. We're there, we've been there since 1877. We're one of the oldest schools in um, in New Zealand, um, in the Auckland particularly. And so we're, we've been here a long time. Uh, we're a big school, people don't know where we are, they go past Calmere Street and they see a little sign and we've got 805 to 13 year olds in there uh, trying to all live happily together. Um, we are, so we are a one to eight, year one to eight school or, uh, for, for us, us old timers who were in the old system up to form two. 
Um, we have, we're, we are very collaborative learning spaces. This, the, the wonderful Sabres construction built us a brilliant 24 classroom open plan block, which is, is very successful. So we are, most of our students are living in pods of 50, 60 kids working with three or four teachers. We have a lot of staff, we've got 74 staff. Um, you can see there from those numbers that a number of our staff are support staff, teacher aides, um, counsellors, all sorts of things. Who would have thought we had a school counsellor in a, in a primary school? Um, we have specialists, a music teacher and, STEAM, and a STEAM technology teacher. We think they are very important subjects in, our, in, our, um, in, in 2022. And we have a lot of staff giving a lot of support to a number of our, our students, including our art therapist, who deals with our students who have real trauma in their lives. Um, so it's a, it's a busy place. Um, but as I said, we've been here a very long time. And only 10 years ago, we would have been at 400, we would have had a, a roll of 400, uh, if, if not less. So um, it's really, it's really amazing. And also we have students in our school who had grandparents and great grandparents in our school, uh, which is amazing. I haven't had that before in the schools I've taught at. Um, so it's very tight. We're a very multicultural school. Um, only three years ago, that New Zealand European percentage was 48. And so you can see by those figures there, there's, we're, a, we're a very diverse school. Um, and we have a growing population of our Indian students, uh, uh, particularly. And these are Indian students, Indian children who are New Zealand born, their parents were New Zealand born. Um, so it's very generational Kiwis, but with different cultural identities. And they are very, um, very strong in maintaining those identities too, as well as being Kiwi kids. So you run around seeing these beautiful students of, of Indian descent who sound who sound like Kiwis, and I think that's a great story of, of uh, it's a very Auckland story. And so while we do have um, a lot of modern um, immigrant children, not so much in the last two years, um, we do have a lot of our students who, uh, as I said, parents of New Zealand born. Um, so that's a, so that makes for a really cool and a very vibrant. Um, situation for our school. It makes also for a real challenge on how we engage with those 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 parents and those families, um, because what we used to do ten years ago for school fundraising is not what we can do now always because it's not actually inclusive. The old trivia nights, which are fun, the nights that you might do this and that, which you, we would have done when I was at school or in previous schools, they're not the in, uh, events that engage a lot of our families. Um, a lot of our cultural families want to involve their children more in the things that we do post school. So there's all these different challenges that we have around ensuring that those um, families have, are fully engaged in our school and feel included in our school. Um, so we're listening to them very carefully around that. And one of the things that we've done differently this year is to employ a, an engagement and fundraising a coordinator for the school. It's something that Ministry of Education don't like, so don't go and tell them this, because they don't want any school funds going into this sort of role. Um, and one of the criteria around this person's role is that they generate enough, their income is generated by their fundraising. But part of their job is not just about raising money for the school, but it's actually about improving their level of engagement with all our, with our, all our community members. And that's been really successful, and we've done a number of things this year already around um, getting that engagement to, uh, higher up. <clears throat> so we're, our, our school strategic plan is very straightforward. We've got four things we want our community, our staff, our students, our whānau to do, and that's to look after well-being, relationships, learning of course, and citizenship. And I know the bottom one was a massive interest to Rotary. We want our students to engage and contribute in our world. And I think this is a really uh, important part of our education journey. Our students, are st uh, some of our students, particularly the 12 year olds now, are stressed about the st situation of the world. Because their lives, and I'm not sure if it's a good or bad thing, because they have these things that come at, come at them 24 hours a day, they can't get away from the Ukraine war. They can't get away from 
um, global warming, they can't get away from poverty, housing, it's coming at them. And whether they like it or not, they are continually getting fed this information. Now, the world has always been full of drama, but when I was running around as a student in the 70s, as a, as a child in the 70s, we had two television networks, we watched the six o'clock news, and I'm still trying to convince my parents that maybe three news might be better, I don't know, but one news has got to be one news. And the information was very limited. So we, the fear I had maybe, nuclear war may have been around in the 80s and there were some dramas that as children we, we got a little bit of, but the rest of it we weren't so exposed to. We just got on and we were kids, you know, climbed trees and fell out of trees and did all sorts of things. But these students are hearing and breathing these continual little dramas. And so I think part of that citizenship focus is around, hey, let's get, let's get you involved with solving some of that in a community way. You know, whether it's planting trees, whatever it might be doing. And I'll tell you an amazing project that's going on at the school at the moment. We, can, we, we create thousands and millions of chip packets in New Zealand, foil chip packets around the world. And a project that's come out of London is that we've got the ability to iron all those chip packets together and make rugs for the homeless people in Auckland. And so we've got kids who are taking all those foil chip packets, they're riding together, this is a project that's come out of the UK, they get sealed, they get put, a rug gets put in them, and they get given to the city mission to give out to the homeless. Now there's 8,000 people in Auckland living on the streets. And we've got our students in a, involved in a project that's now providing them blankets. Now we know that's a short term thing, we, want, we don't want anyone living in the streets. We also know there are people out there who want to live on the streets. But there's a project that the kids can see as something they can do uh, is effective in making a difference. And those are the sort of projects, um, and, I'm, you know, and I know we've had some early conversations, not with Sharon and Peter, but we know about Beyond Water. And those are sort of, those sort of projects that students can see that they're making a small difference. That actually makes a huge, um, makes a huge amount of value to their education, their experience. And I think, and that's where community to me is important because a student thinks, one student needs to understand that a small change can actually make a big difference. Um, so that citizen part is really important. So what have we noticed around COVID? It's highlighted the things that we knew were sitting around anyway. And it's particularly highlighted the, uh, the, uh, a well, the well-being concerns of, of a lot of our students. And the anxiety would be the, probably the, the biggest concern around that. Our, our, a lot of our students are arriving, not all of them, um, but a larger number arriving with a sense of anxiety to school. Um, and when you think we have a school counsellor who works two days a week, should be working five days a week, and is for those two, and would be busy five days a week, from students in year three and year two up to students in year eight, so that covers seven, eight year olds around to um, you know thirteen year olds. It's amazing we and you know and, and that's the resource we need. Secondary schools have a brilliant system for health. That all secondary schools have a very good health centres, counsellors. Why are we not having those at the primary and intermediate level? Because it, wouldn't it be great, isn't it more preventative to have those people at our level, so those students are going through to the high schools, well adjusted, ready for change. Um, so that's something, and the government is addressing this to a smaller part, but of course it's not nearly a, a, enough as what we want. So there's a lot of that happening in the world, but we have um, a wide range of resourcing that we've, we've realised that our LZ community is classic for this, um, this, I've come from high decile 10 communities, Kui Marama, and while there's issues in all communities, we know that, I knew that most of the resourcing, the community was pretty well resourced. In our LZ community, we have a really wide range. We have a number of our community is, is well resourced, but we have a number down in, at, at, this, at this level too. And what I discovered during COVID is that we were forgetting about this sort of third in the middle. Uh, we were good down here at the really needy end, but we were missing the group here. And, 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 and they're the people who go in and out of that resourcing. They're well resourced for most of the time, all of a sudden the car breaks down and a few big things kick in, and their resourcing gets stretched. And, the, and their levels of stress get stretched, and of course that comes into school. So we really realised as we wandered around the community delivering, Karen, I like your comment, we were, get, we were out delivering Chromebooks with my little bit of paper. When the police stopped us, they said, what are you doing? I said, oh, food, Chromebooks, you know, like, fair enough, on you go. Um, 
that we enjoyed those moments of getting up. And the streets were so free, it was like, whoa, here we go. Um, and we discovered that when we when we delivered all those products and things to our communities, that there is a wide range. Um, increased level of stress within our school families, of course. Um, you know, kids are listening to what their parents are saying. And what happened to COVID, as you well know, is that there are two types of stresses. People at home working the hardest they've ever worked, trying to save their businesses, trying to keep their schools operating. And then there was the other end, where that, that was stressful, where people were super stressed because they were losing their jobs. And so the stress crossed everywhere. And, and while some people did really well out of COVID, some people in our community have done very well out of COVID financially, uh, they are still under stress for managing all those different things. So we noticed a lot of stress. And the first day of 2022, I wish I'd had a camera at our school. There was a, a number of families turned up to school. They didn't know what class their, their child was in. They hadn't bothered to go online to look. Where, or the, the, the faces of, of terror on their, on, their, on their adults look as they came into school. COVID was still hanging around. And so we've got all these students and parents at our front gate coming in. Kids are crying because mum's crying and mum's stressed. And I, I was just going, holy moly, what's happening? You know, we'd done all we could, we thought, to get all the information out. But I think it was just that, here we go again, COVID's still here, 2022. You know, we've had an okay summer, but we're back into it. And it's so we just saw this sort of eruption of, of, of worry. And it made, of course, we just went, we need to do some more work in this space because we can't have this because adults have a job to protect their children. And as I say to parents all the time, you know, you can be stressed and I, that's not great, but you have, a, you have a, a situation where you need to protect your children from that stress because they will deal with it in a very different way. Um, and then, of course, uh, a decline of overall achievement. Yeah, there's been a definite decline in our reading, writing, maths uh, across the board. Uh, it's hit terribly in our Māori Pacifica communities um, because their stress, of course, is um, the, 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 there's a, a number of stresses there. Um, but it's, uh, and, and we have seen a real de a decline in the overall trend. What we have seen just recently, which has been great, is they are beginning to progress. They are actually moving forward. They're not to, uh, many of them aren't where they should be, but they are progressing. Now, that's a good story. If you weren't progressing and you're still below where you should be, that's a worry. But we have seen a decline in our overall achievement. So, you know, most of our kids in New Zealand should be, 85% of our school should be sitting at where they need to be for their education, in their curriculum area. And we don't have that at the moment. We would, we would only have 60% of our students who are in writing. Writing is a very difficult subject. It's always a bit lower. But the reading one is the one that really interests me is our reading, you know, we should be 85% of our students should be where they should be for reading, and that would only be 70% at the moment. Part of this, again, how many students, particularly in that 12 to 13 age, we, we know that the reading hours at home have come substantially reduced because they're on their phones. Uh, and, and yes, they can read on their phone, but I don't think being on your phone is the same as picking up a, a book and reading. So there's a lot of work to do in that area as well. So let's get on to that. What we realised is school, the physical environment of school and the emotional environment of school is so critical. And of course, when we opened up again, parents went, thank goodness, we love school, thank you teachers, because none of us are great teachers at home. <laughs> Even teachers themselves, I struggle to teach my children at home. Um, we really love you guys, have our children back <laughs> post lockdown, good luck. Um, but all of a sudden we went, the, the school environment is such a critical part of, our, of, of students. They come into school every day, they need to have a physical environment that's engaging, attractive, and, and so they can have every chance to, oh, sorry, every chance to, um, to do the best they can at school. So that's really important. Um, we need to engage in experts a lot more. Um, that's really critical for schools. Um, we need to oh, wrong one. We need to utilise our community because the solutions to a school's problems sit in the community. Really important. We need to engage in local curriculum. What I was talking about before about doing all these projects that actually have um, sustainable value and 
value on the children's education and we need to investigate all the different um, alternative education programs because some of our kids cannot be at school for um, five hours, six hours a day. And the last one there is around a better understanding of the needs of our community to ensure we have the resources, that, that everyone has resources, and that leads me on to Ellerslie Cares, which is a group of, in the school that we've set up to really look at continuing and developing a stronger connection to our community. And this has come from a number of feedback from parents around actually we're struggling and you need to help us a bit more. And so there's a small group for us at the school who are organising it. And I'll just show you this one here, which is really important. That's the breakdown. As I said, we can't solve everyone's problems, but we can offer some financial support for those school costs. We can, we can offer some advice around where to go for help, around professional services. We can make sure there are things that they have in the community, uh, food boxes, I've got one in my car actually I'm delivering today, uh, and clothing and wellbeing goods. And we can also, the big one down the end, is we, can, we have access to people that we can get in to talk to our community about cyberbullying, anxiety, um, all those information evenings at the school. So it's using the school as a really good venue to facilitate a lot of those evenings too. So there's a whole area of, of difference there, but really important, and the engagement piece I think is critical. Um, and you can see where, um, that, and that's a, a really good, you can see where our fundraising and engagement coordinator sits beautifully under this umbrella. And how, and the, the important thing that we often forget is the identification is important. So as I've said to our community, we are all responsible to feed into the school people who might need help. And there's an email address around that. We have, um, we've got to provide the support. But the one that we often drop the ball on is the third one, is the follow-up. It's all very well for us to identify and provide the support. But then we have to circle back around and say, how's it going? What else do you need? Uh, remember, we can't solve everything. But is, how's that gone? Is there somewhere else we can send you? So the other day was a class and we had a, we had a parent who's lost their husband, struggling. The daughter said to me, mum is really upset. She's threatening to take her own life. What am I going to do? And, and I said, I, we knew that the, the um, student belonged to a church, so I rang the church. The church got on to the mother, uh, supported the mother. And the follow-up for me was to re-ring the, the past, the, the vicar again and say, how did that go? Is it okay? What do we need to do? So the, or is there anything else that we need to provide? So the follow-up is critical because I think that you can drop, you can easily forget about, you can easily set people up and then just forget about it, but you actually need to circle back around. And of course, we have the joy of seeing the children every day so we can check in very sensitively how things might be going. But that's actually incredible. In the last year, we've lost four Five parents have died in the last 18 months, mainly from cancer, two young mothers. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been incredible. Um, and the worry I have with that is certain cultural groups have that, keep that very quiet and very, and, very, um, and very to their heart, which I totally get, but of course their children are suffering terribly sometimes at school. And their kids are actually helping the, 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 the surviving adult. So that's been quite interesting over, and, and some of that has been COVID related. So thank you, a huge thanks to the school around your funding you give us. You know, the two or three thousand dollars you've given us has been um, a, a lifesaver. It's really meant that we, um, I don't want to have students at school worried about school uniform. And, and, and as a human right, we can't, we can't let that be a problem. School uniform cannot get in the way of good learning. So if I need to buy fleeces to keep them warm, we're just gonna buy fleeces and, 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 and where that costs, and your money goes a long way towards those sort of things. I don't want kids to miss out of school camp, so we'll fund school camp. I, every year my mother-in-law gives me two camp fees, which I'm really grateful for, because <laughs> it means two other students or four kids can go to camp. We've had some early discussions about an outdoor project with you that you're maybe helping us in the next year, with an outdoor classroom project we have at our school we want to get over the line. And I, and I know Beyond Water, and I do apologise, I put an S on the end of Beyond Water, I know it's Beyond Water, so. Sorry, but I know we've had some early discussion about linking our students with some students in Africa, East Africa around that, because I think that would be hugely uh, beneficial um, and make a, really, a big difference. Um, but I do, it's been great to connect again, and, and thank you, Karen, you, you, you keep keeping us connected, which is great, um, and we appreciate all the help in, that Alice Rotary gives us, and, and thank you for your time 
this morning and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, questions. Yes. What's the average cost for a school camp? Good, yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, more than it was 10 years ago. So we're going to Chosen Valley this year, which is an Araremu uh, for our year sixes, and that's uh, two nights, three days. And that will cost the students about $280, but the board will wear a $5,000 cost on that. So we will take a hit. Uh, and that's just gone up. They've just increased their prices from $70 a night to $78 a night. Uh, we go to Motutapu, uh, three nights, four days, don't get me started on Fuller's expense for that. It, take, it costs us uh, nearly $5,000 to get across there. Uh, so that's, a 300 and, that's an over $300 per student. But again, we, we will wear, we will budget a ten thousand dollar hit in that one, because the problem we've got in education is the the ministry say to say to us, if you're forcing that we don't force the kids to go to camp by the way, but if you're making that a compulsory activity, you should be funding it. And we know this drama around who funds what in education. Uh, anything that's curriculum based should be funded by the school. We don't have the money to do that. We can, we don't have the money to if we're sending a bunch of students to the museum, we shouldn't be charging the parents anything for that. But we might charge five dollars or ten dollars. It's totally illegal. But if we were stick with the, the, the party line, we wouldn't do anything outside the school. Um, and New Zealand and camp in New Zealand is such a great experience. So we just we just suck up the cost some from somewhere else, uh, and we do a really good job of trying to reduce the cost. But yeah, camps are expensive. Health and safety is super important, of course, but it's added a massive amount of of cost to camps. Just, just on that one, Nick, I'm involved with um, Murray on Motor Tap. Oh, yeah. And, um, but it's a great camp. Yeah, and, uh, and particularly, and then there's another charity in behind that that, that provides support to schools who can't afford to go. Yeah. Are you aware of that? Absolutely. So you can make application uh, to support that. Yeah. So that's a really good question. And Talk to Duncan. Yeah, and uh, Duncan's fantastic. Um, we, we un, well, fortunately, unfortunately, we, we get rated by the ministry. That, uh, the decile system is, is gone. It's going in January. Um, we are a decile nine school, 10 being the top. I don't think that's a true representation of us. Um, so all that sort of funding that you're mentioning, which is fantastic, tends to go to lower yeah, decile right, schools, sure. uh, or now what we call equity index, but, but it's still worth applying. We, we, we are look, I know that they're looking yeah. to help. And I think to, to, to that point too, it's, it's, we're not ask, we're just asking for that sort of that little bit, aren't we? We don't we know that many of our parents can fund. And actually what an, what another initiative which we're doing now, because parents have said how can we help? Parents uh, we've, we've set up a system where I'll give you an example. We had the school disco in the last two nights. So we set up a system where a parent could buy a ticket and then they could buy other tickets for other kids. And we had a hundred tickets bought by parents. Uh, that got distributed to kids who didn't need to buy a ticket. So that sort of buy one and donate one concept is becoming really, really more uh, popular. Um, and I think that's, that's great. And I think there's a realisation from those parents who can give a bit more to actually, yep, yeah, we're into helping others. Um, so that's been really great. But no, I thank you for that because Duncan, Duncan knows all that stuff real, doesn't he? Yeah. Any more questions? You've Thank covered you. such a, uh, a brilliant range. Well, I'll just be quiet because uh, Roger is going to say thanks. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I just want to thank you for coming and talking to us this morning. We've got a little window, yeah. a little peek now of the complexity of what you're doing. What, what I love to see is your enthusiasm, your feeling of the skills and management and control if you needed to in, in your sort of position. Uh, we have a lot to do with schools and is that those that are run by people with enthusiasm and skills are successful schools, they do very well and the kids do well. And so I think you're really on track with all of that. Thank you for coming and sharing that with us and uh, we wish you very, very well. And I have a pen oh, for you oh, so you can you. hang in your memory of coming oh, you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. I invite you to come and, come and have a cup of tea at LZ School at any 